what we're going to do today is pick up discussing the second variant of the Android Hammer framework. You recall the first variant dealt with, with posting and processing runnables. Well, now we're going to be sending and handling messages. And you'll see as we look through the, this whole discussion, it's, it's very much the same, you know, two sides of the same coin. In fact, a lot of the processing that takes place internal to Android is identical. It's just the same pieces of code altogether. So we'll talk about the parts that are more interesting and differ. OK, so basically the handler defines methods for sending and removing message objects. And they do this on the handler's message queue. We've looked at that before. You don't typically see the message queue. It just exists sort of in, as infrastructure. The messages that you send contain data that is sent to the handler and then stuck on the message queue and then pulled off later by the handler and processed and dispatching takes place. And we'll see how that works. You probably have a good inkling of how that works already. Here is some of the stuff that goes into a message. Now, as I say down here in a, an editorial comment, this is kind of a hack. So it was clear that people were like, well, we've got some things we want to send around. And for various reasons that we'll talk about later, we want to be able to have more flexibility than we get with just posting runnables. But we're just going to kind of put a hodgepodge of things into these data structures that are called messages. So here are the things that go into a message um, by, by default. And you'll see easily how to make it more extensible if you want. So one thing that goes into a message, probably the most important thing, is the what. The what is basically an int that can be used as a tag to indicate to the receiver what this message is for. Is this a message that's meant to start a dialogue box? Is this a message that's meant to display something to the screen? Is this a message that's meant to delete something? Whatever, right? That's, that's what the message is. It's typically an integer number that you can store. And both sides have to agree on what the meaning of the number is. Then there's also a pair of ints, arg1 and arg2, like thing1 and thing2 from Dr. Seuss. And these are used to, to pass integer values. If you want to pass an integer value, you can put them in here. So sometimes you need them, sometimes you don't. But they put two integers there just to pass stuff around. That's a little bit narrow, though. So another thing that they do is they have something that's called an object. And an object, of course, is a Java object. So that could actually point to whatever you want to put in there. So you can pass sort of an open-ended set of things through the object field in a message. And then it's up to the receiver to look at the type and then maybe do some downcasting and so on to figure out what exactly you have put in there and what to do with it. But this gives you, you know, sort of open-ended set of things. All of this stuff is typically used when messages are passed back and forth between uh, stuff in the same address space. It's also possible to pass things that go across address spaces. And when you do that, then they have something called a messenger. And the messenger basically can be used to reply back to where the message came from, which could be in the same address space or could be in a different address space. And we'll take a look and see how that stuff works um, if we have time. I th we'll probably get to that probably next week when we talk about how the inter process communication mechanisms work with Android. And so this is something you don't typically work with unless you start doing inter process communication, which is actually a very cool part of Android, by the way. All right, so the data is actually processed. One of these messages is actually processed by the handle message hook method. And we'll see some examples of how that works. The handle message is processed in the thread that's associated with the handler. And remember, again, the rule is that if you don't do anything to the contrary, a handler belongs to the thread where it's created. And it does this by using the magic of thread local storage, which is the thread specific storage pattern. But you can also create a looper in for some other thread that runs in the background. And then you can give that to the handler if you want the things to run in the background. And there's a cool idiom that gets used, which we'll see when we talk about the Android intent service, which is a way of doing this. It's a very common idiom used in Android to have messages passed between separate threads. Under the hood, this is a variant, a somewhat uh, lobotomized variant of the active object pattern, which is a POSA2 pattern. And um, if you take a look here, you'll find information about active object. In a nutshell, the part of active object we care about here is the part that says the thread that invokes a request for service is not the same thread as the one that runs the request and processes it. 
So there's a difference between the thread that invokes something and the thread that processes it. That's what an active object is in this context. There's more to active objects because you typically have callbacks and uh, futures and all this kind of good stuff. But this is a variant of that. Now, as we talked about before, compare and contrast the active object with a monitor object. In a monitor object, the thread that invokes the monitor object is the same thread that processes the, the method when you invoke on the monitor object. You just, the receiver, in quotes, steals the thread of control of the caller and it runs in that context. In contrast, in the active object pattern, these things actually run in separate um, threads. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. The particular mechanism we have here does not implement the two-way aspects of active objects, although if you want to, it's easy to do that just by doing the reply to stuff that we were looking at. OK. As with ha runnables and handlers, there's different categories. Uh, runnables and handlers are different categories. Here, the, here's what they are. They look suspiciously like the other ones. So you have ones for being able to put messages on the queue right away, for processing either at the end or at the front. There's one that you can use to send something that's delayed relative to the current time of day. There's also something you can use to specify absolute time to run at that time. And then you can also, and both of these support timed operations. And then there's something where you can put an empty message that doesn't contain any data. It just basically says what you want it to do. So you could use this maybe for like some kind of shutdown message where you just say shut down, but there's no data that's associated or initialized with it. You can also take messages off the queue. And as you can see there, um, you can take them off in a couple of ways. One way to take them off is via the what field, which is what was sent um, as part of the message, like here, or in the message itself. The message contents contain what. So you can remove by what, and you can also uh, removed by the object that was put in the message. So you can remove it a couple different ways. There's a set of methods for making messages. These are factory methods. You're familiar with factory methods by now, which are creational patterns. And basically what these things do is they return messages that are obtained out of a pool. There's a pool of, of things. And we'll see a bit more about those shortly. Dispatching methods, same as before. Uh, dispatching the methods to be processed, and then handling them. So handle message is what's used. That's the hook that has to be overridden. This runs in the thread that's associated with the handler instance. And here's an important thing. When handle message returns, the Android framework that invokes the handle message callback recycles the message right away. So what this means is if you want to keep the message for some other purpose, you need to go ahead and make a copy of it that will have a longer lifetime. So you can see what happens here is if, if we're in a handle message callback and we have a message and we're not ready to process the message yet for whatever reason, the, the stars have not aligned at this point, we then have to go to the message and say, hey, clone yourself, make a new message, and then we're going to go ahead and send this new message and put it on a queue or something like that. Um, you cannot just take this message and stick it on the queue because the second the handle message method returns, that message is recycled. So you'll have really strange bugs in your program if you don't remember to make a copy of a message to store it for later purposes. Uh, believe me, I found that out the hard way. And there's an article here that talks about this and it shows why you need to do it and talks about the issue of recycling. Okay. So let's take a look um, at an example of sending and handling messages. This is kind of a fun example because it actually looks inside of Android itself and how some of the things work internally. So first of all, just a quick recap. Here's how you deal with handlers. You, you pass a runnable to a handler. And that's pretty easy because everything's self-contained in the runnable. Message handling is a little bit more complicated, though, because now you have to pass a message to a handler. And oh, by the way, you also have to override the handle message hook method to deal with the results when they come back. So there's sort of two steps, not just one. So we're going to use a simple example here based on something called a countdown timer, which is an interesting abstraction provided by Android that I'll talk more about in a second. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and start the countdown timer in a background thread. And then that thing is going to be run in the user interface thread. And you'll see how it works here in a second. How it's, how it's processed. Okay. 
we're also going to show kind of how some of the other pieces work under the hood. So here's the countdown timer. This is the countdown timer class. This is defined by Android. And what it basically does is it allows you to schedule stuff that will be dispatched at an appropriate point in the future. So you can say, I want this thing to be counted down, and it'll, it'll keep running until uh, a certain point. So here's the actual code. You can see here, this goes ahead and makes a countdown timer. And what this is saying is this countdown timer is going to run in 30 seconds. So 30,000 milliseconds from now, this thing's going to run. Now, the, the background thread is where this is going to get started. But the actual callback is going to be dispatched in the UI thread. And that's because this object was created in the UI thread. Now, the other thing this does, as we'll see in a second, is um, once a second, the onTick method is going to be called. So once every second, and that's what we can designate how often this thing gets called. Once a second, on tick gets called. And when this thing gets called, he's going to go ahead and print out how much time is remaining to run. When the whole thing is finished, then at that point, the onFinish method gets called back, and we just print some message to the output. OK, any questions about the overall approach here? So we declare an, an object called a countdown timer, standard Android object. You can use it with a lot of things. And it counts down at some periodic interval until it's done, and then it goes away. OK, so we're going to have the background thread called start. Just, just to illustrate, these things can be in different threads. It also shows a few other things that are cool. And so here's basically how this works. Countdown timer is an abstract class, which means you have to subclass it. And you have to fill in a couple of methods, on tick and on finish. So you have to override these things somehow. So we'll look at how the source code works. Here's the constructor for countdown timer. As you can see, you give it the number of milliseconds in the future when you want this thing to stop running. And then you give it an, out, an interval. And it'll call on finish when it's done counting down. And it'll call on tick at the interval you designate here to do something at each interval. Wherever you create this object, a handler is created. So if you create the object in the main UI thread, this handler is, has got affinity for the UI thread. If you create it in some other background thread, that handler has affinity in the background thread. You know how that works because the constructor of a handler takes a look at the, um, or uses thread local storage to, to register itself with the looper. Then the subclass of um, countdown timer is this true? I, I th actually, I, th I take that back. The subclass doesn't have to override this hook method. It has to override two other methods. The, the, um, the base class, the countdown timer, implements this method. And here's what it does. It's going to do some stuff with the message that's sent to it. And I'll show you how it gets sent to it. And then it'll call back the on tick and on finished methods at the appropriate points in time. All right, so let's see what happens. This is when. When someone wants to start the countdown timer, which can come from anywhere, it can come from a foreground thread, it can come from a background thread, it can come from the same thread where the countdown timer runs, it can come from a different thread than where the countdown timer is going to run, whatever. What it does is it goes ahead and calls start, and that goes ahead and obtains a message. So it, it gets a message from the pool, and then it sends the message to the handler, which might trans. Uh, you know, go between threads, or it might just be stuck in the same thread that did the call. It all depends on how this is run. Here's what the send message call looks like inside of the handler, the implementation of this thing. So it goes ahead and uh, associates things with the looper where the handler is created. So there's the handler. And then um, basically the, the code for getting the message from send message through the framework is basically identical to what we looked at before. So that's going to end up, end up putting it on the message queue. It'll then be pulled out of the queue by the looper, and the dispatch message method will be called. And in this case, it's going to call the handle message method on the handler. And then that will turn around and get called back in the looper's thread. That'll call the handle message method on the handler that we defined here. And then that has some things to do. This is what actually implements the countdown timer logic. So if 
the number of milliseconds left, and it's, it's computed by some computation by taking the amount of time you're waiting and then the current time of day, if you're done, on finished is called back. So that's how the hook method gets called. Otherwise, if this got called back too early, but it's not really time yet to do the dispatching, we put a message back on the message queue saying, hey, there's still some time left here. If it's indeed the case that the interval has elapsed, then we go ahead and call back the on tick method saying, you know, do something at this interval. And then when that method returns, then another message is requeued for the time interval. So after you finish processing one thing, then you go ahead and process the next one. You, you queue up another thing. So after one on tick method is called, then it goes ahead and queues up a message to, to have it called back again in the future. And there's an intrinsic lock using the synchronized statement to make sure that the on tick methods don't end up looping each other if they take a long time to run. OK, so that's basically how that works. Now, a bunch of things to note here from a, a framework perspective, from a framework design point of view. So this is clearly a framework. How do we know it's a framework? Well, it's got inversion of control. Android runs the event loop. We're using the Android Hammer framework, and it's sending and receiving messages mechanisms to do all the processing. We're just, we, the, the people who are subclassing from countdown timer, all we do is we subclass it, and we fill in the on tick and on finished hook methods. So everything else is controlled for us. There's canonical control flow. There's canonical structure. All that's done for us. We just have to override a few things. And that's the third part of what makes something a framework is this semi-complete portion of an application. So all the details are all done for us by Android. And we just come along and fill in a couple of methods at the edge of the design for what we need to do, which is handle ticks and handle when we're done. OK, any questions about that? So lots of good examples of frameworks. This is just a small piece, but it, it shows the points. Countdown Latch is used all over the place in Android. And uh, it's a useful class for doing various kinds of timer-related operations with a Hammer framework. OK, so that's a quick overview of um, sending and, re and receiving or sending, sending and handling messages. What we're going to do now is we're going to talk about how we use this stuff back in our threaded downloads application, which I'll show you some of the code for. So now, you know, if you think about what we did before, we talked about the download with runnable class. And we talked about the rest of the framework earlier. Now we're going to kind of dive down here into the message passing portion of all this, which, as always, you can download here. Here's the way it works. You've got your GUI. You click a button. That causes the handle button click message to be called, method to be called, which runs here. And that's where all the magic happens. You can take a look at the code there, and that's what we're going to look at. Uh, underneath the hood, what happens here is that a background thread is created, and that thread goes ahead and downloads the content that's requested by the user. And then when the content is done, several messages are sent to the UI thread to tell it to do various kinds of things. And so we'll see some of the messages that, that get sent. Those messages, of course, are pulled out of the message queue by the UI thread, which turns around and calls the handle message hook to do the processing in the handler. And we'll see how all that works. This solution is ever so much more complicated, not a whole lot more complicated, a little bit more complicated than the runnable-based version, just because there's a few more things going on. We have to worry about sending and receiving. And we're also passing a couple of different messages back and forth. So let's go ahead now and take a look at the code. So we'll bring up the code. This is part of the download with messages file. So you can see here, download with messages implements button strategy, as we've seen before. It creates a, an internal thread that's going to be used to actually do the downloading in the background. We have a method which is inherited from button strategy called download and display image, which takes a download context. As you'll see here, what it does is it goes ahead and it creates something called a message handler. We'll look at that in a second. Notice that the message handler is created in the user interface thread. So this is going to run in the context of the user interface thread. We haven't actually spawned a separate thread at this point. We then go ahead and create a new runnable. Here's what it does. <coughs> it's actually fairly long. So this runnable, which we'll 
be run in the background thread, goes ahead and it obtains a message with the what field of show toast. So it's going to say, hey, go ahead and show the toast. It then goes ahead and sends the show toast message to the message handler, which is running, as we'll see in a second, in the UI thread. This, this will run in a background thread. Then, running in the background thread, it goes ahead and it downloads the image using the download context to get the function to call and using the download context to get the URL to download, which we had set earlier. And then after that thing is done, it goes ahead and makes another message called, it's a message that's got the display image what field, and it's also got the object, which is the image we just downloaded. So those are the two fields we pass here, and then we send that to the message handler. So notice we're, we're basically running in the background, or we will be running in the background once we get a little further down in this method. And we're, we're feeding messages to the UI thread, which will interpret those messages and do something to them. Here's the very bottom of the uh, download and display method, or display image method. It makes a new thread, stashes it off over here so we have something we can cancel if we need to, and it goes ahead and starts the thread. So at that point, a thread is now running in the background. It's running that processing. It's sending messages to the to the UI thread using the hammer framework and the send handler mechanism. And it's downloading the file in the background as well. So that's how things get downloaded. We'll look a bit more detail at what the message handler does in a second. Here is the cancel download method. When this guy gets called, it means we want to cancel the current download. We display a toast saying, hey, we're, we're canceling the download. And then we interrupt the thread so it'll stop, that thread that we spawned up here. So that will stop and go ahead and evaporate in this case. Um, now keep in mind what that thread's really doing. Most of the time it's probably either downloading or processing the image. So uh, it should be cancelable if it hasn't finished what it's doing. Here's Message Handler. So Message Handler is a private static class that extends Handler. Now just to re remind you the context here, here's how we use this thing. So you can see up here we say message handler, new message handler, download context. So, so we create this guy in the context of the UI thread when this method is called. And then, of course, we use him here to do the sending. We send the messages to the message handler. So here's what the message handler is. It, it's a handler, and it defines a couple of messages. These are the, the what uh, tags, so show toast and display image. They just have to have different values. It doesn't really matter what they are. And that's what gets used to indicate where to pass or what messages are being passed. Then it also has something kind of funky. It's got this weak reference called download context, or this weak reference, which is parameterized by download context, and it's called m context. And we need this because we're actually passing in a reference to something enclosing us. So this is actually coming from the, the outer scope. And now we're making a message handler inside of here. And we need this in order to make sure we don't have a circular dependency such that garbage collection would not get run. So using weak references are a way to help avoid the memory leaks that would otherwise occur. Here's the handle message method. As you can see here, what it does is when it gets called, it checks to see, it goes ahead and gets the context to make sure we haven't had it garbage collected out from underneath us. And then depending on what it is, um, if it's the show toast message, we display a toast saying downloading via handlers and messages. Otherwise, if it's the display image met method, we go ahead and display the image, casting the object field of the message back into a bitmap so it can be displayed properly. So real clean, real neat. You know, if, if we were really obsessive compulsive about um, avoiding switch statements, which arguably is a good thing if you're really into OO, we could always build a little data structure that hold commands that correspond to doing this work. And when the message comes in to handle message, we could take the message what field, which is what we're doing there, message.what, and we could look up into this map, like a sparse array, pull out command objects, and say, execute yourself. Right? If we really were obsessed with not having any switch statements. Actually, I'd probably do that. <laughs> 
but it was getting over, it was getting a little bit carried away here, so uh, I kept it simple for purposes of exposition. Any questions about that? Do you guys remember from CS, those of you who took CSD51, what is the downside of having switch statements with explicit cases? Why is that a bad thing? Well, it's going to be really hard for you to revise this code in the future because you're going to have to go through and change all of these cases. Whereas if, it's, if you're passing in objects, then you can just take out or add classes. Right. So th there's a couple problems with switch statements. Uh, number one is, is this more general issue of just having to go laboriously through the code and modify all places where the switch statements are used and add the appropriate case uh, variants and so on. The, the more subtle issue, which I've gotten burned on many times as well, I hate to say it, is switch statements have this bizarre sy semantic where if you forget to put a break or return here, it'll fall through to the next case. And so it's really easy to make that mistake. In fact, there's a famous story, this is probably 10, 15 years ago at this point, the, the AT&T central office switching system that covered like the New York, New England area went down. Now, these systems are supposed to have like five nines reliability or whatever, which means you can have, you know, <coughs> two seconds of outage every hundred years or something. And the thing was down for like a day. So they're like for the next 10,000 years, there can be no downtime at all. Otherwise, they blew their service level agreement. <laughs> and when they were looking at the code, they realized that someone forgot to put a break statement into the, into the, um, the code. So that was why it, it failed. So it was a classic, you know, I think it was C code, probably not C++ code, but it was obviously a problem. Um, there's all kinds of examples of the history of C, especially where people just do weird things and they get upset later when they realize they used an error-prone feature. So that's, that's kind of why we avoid that. All right. So that covers two out of the three mechanisms here in the, uh, the download, threaded downloads application. What we're going to do now is we're going to quickly finish up the rest of these slides, and then we will go ahead and talk about the last piece, the last triad of the three things, which is async task. Uh, let's see. All right, so here's just some things to think about when you use this stuff. Send message is pretty common. If you grep through Android's code, you'll see lots and lots and lots of places where they use this stuff. You can enqueue messages and process things later, either within a single thread or from one thread to another. Very, very common to use background, use uh, the message passing mechanisms in Android to have background threads talk to the UI thread. That's probably 99% of the cases is that particular use case, and that happens a lot. There are message passing variant of the active object pattern where you can basically decouple senders and receivers so they can run in different threads, which gives you more flexibility. The one thing to keep in mind, though, is that um, typically, although I suppose if you really stood in your head, you could work around this somehow, Usually the way things work is you've got one or more threads running in the background sending messages to a single thread. So the whole notion of a thread pool doesn't really come into play with things like the hammer framework. It's, if, if there's anything more than two threads involved, it's, it's a bunch of threads sending to one thread. You don't typically have a bunch of threads sending to a bunch of threads. That will get used in the next example when we talk about async task. So that's kind of a, a limitation in some sense. Um, and with everything, there's a trade-off between flexibility and simplicity. So, so the sending and receiving of messages, sending and handling of messages, is a little bit more flexible than posting runnables and processing runnables. But it's also a little bit more complicated. So posting runnables is really simple, but it doesn't do quite as much stuff. Countdown timer is a nice example. You can go look at the code. It illustrates all the things you need to be aware of in this context. And um, so that's why we use that to show that. All right, so that is that topic.